Jeffrey. <laughs> so Reagan, in your little bio here, you don't talk about your journalism. No, I Why? don't. Um, I don't know. <laughs> Because we're talking about poetry, and I really think that I keep the two sort of separate. We are ready to start. People might be interested in that. What what journalism? <laughs> Seriously. We are ready to start. Hello, we're ready to start. We're good to go. Oh, okay. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, hi, welcome to this um, uh, the Meet the Poet series here. Um, my name is Jeffrey Nutter. Um, I'm an American poet living in New York, um, and I'm going to talk to the poet Reagan Good. Um, and we're going to hear Reagan read some poems. Um, then we're going to answer some questions. Uh, I'm going to have a little conversation with Reagan, and we're going to learn a lot about her and her work. And I think we'll learn something about um, poetry. Uh, in general, in American poetry in particular. Um, and I'm very excited to talk to Reagan. Um, she's an old friend. The first thing I'm gonna do is I wanna say a few things about Reagan uh, and share her bio with you, just some kind of facts about Reagan. But first I wanna say um, a few words. It's, it's a strange thing being a poet uh, in the United States of America in the 21st century. Um, some countries seem to have a sort of firm awareness of their, of their great poets of the past um, and present, but American poets live in a kind of nation within a nation. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's the nation of poetry. <laughs> People like poetry on some level. I mean, non-poets seem to like poetry on some level and need poetry on some level. And poetry is given a special month to honor it, a month that just passed, that was April National Poetry Month. But poetry seems to remain a strange and alien thing to most people. Some poets want to bring poetry to a mass audience by making it more accessible, which seems like a generous thing to me. It's a generous and noble endeavor. Um, but also generous is writing poetry with a sense that poetry should be true to the complicated experience of being a human being. Um, this calls for poetry that isn't necessarily easy. In fact, it's often hard. The poet is trying not to be difficult for the sake of being difficult, but rather because the sensation of being alive is a complicated thing um, to get at in words and rhythm. This brings us to the poet you're going to hear today. Um, I met Reagan Good 30 years ago as a graduate student at the University of Iowa Writers Workshop. She was then, as now, a brilliant and fiercely intelligent writer. She was writing poems at the time that were obviously different from the things I'd read before. They seemed both very traditional, but also very new and almost avant-garde. Um, Reagan Good still writes poetry that is not easy, but poetry that speaks beautifully to the situation of being human in the world. She's very aware of herself as both a poet and a person living in 21st century America, but also as a member of an extended family of poets and artists reaching back to the beginnings of English poetry. It's by these standards that I think Reagan assesses her own work. She is, as they say, playing the long game. She's very much an American poet, but she does not see herself in terms of her contemporaries. She places herself squarely among a line of American innovators. She channels, channels linguistic exactitude and the richness and the rhythmic and metrical stateliness of Marianne Moore, Elizabeth Bishop, Wallace Stevens. She feels that it is the poet's responsibility and privilege to speak with an authority that takes for granted the idea that the project of poetry is one that is essential to our experience of being in the world, not only as individuals, but as a civilization. All of this aside, her poems are just beautiful and exciting. She has the poet's love of things. In a poem about the Gowanus Canal, for example, she brings in things like coal piles, violet creosote, a giant sulfurous egg, a medieval arch, metal scraps, the Thames River, the river Styx, the liver-colored contaminants of a purple pond. She writes poems about modern sculpture, paleolithic material culture. She writes about the glass flowers at Harvard, wasps, pomegranates, slime stains, and birds. <laughs> it is all subjects for poems. Ultimately, Reagan loves language and she loves the world. And that love is always evident in her poems. 
Reagan attended, as I said, the Writers' Workshop as a Maytag Fellow, um, quite uh, an honorable, uh, uh, an honorable award. She's published two books of poems, The Atlantic House in 2011 and The Needle in 2020. Um, the important poetry critic Stephanie Burt wrote of her work, quote, good as a sense of pentameter and a sense of image and a sense of experiment that almost never go together, unquote. She teaches writing in the architecture program at the Pratt Institute of Architecture and poetry writing at Barnard College. She is interested in romanticism, mysticism, and poems that resist paraphrase, something I want to ask her about. <laughs> her third book of poems, The Blood Ribbon, will be published in 2023. So I guess I could ask you if I got anything wrong there, first of all, or yeah. anything you'd want to elaborate on. But I guess I, I want to, this idea that you say there that you're interested in poems that resist paraphrase. Um, can you talk just a little bit about that? I'm wondering what you, what you, what you mean. I haven't, go ahead. You know what I mean. Um, I <laughs> well, I, I mean, I think that's, you know, actually, um, one of the important things about poetry is that it's not, um, it's, you know, we are trying to describe um, things that really can't be put into words exactly. And that's why, you know, poetry is words in strange orders or words, perfect words in a, a perfect order. Um, but syntax is, is torqued and changed, right? We, we, we are automatically sort of in a suspended state when we go to read poems. Uh, at least that's where I want to be. I want to be suspended, you know, away from this world um, and able to maybe see, you know, dream another world to live in. Um, and so, I mean, I think my poems are, are more almost experiential. They're not narrative, but they're sort mm -hmm. of, ex as you were saying, sort of the experience of living and thinking. Um, I think that's... Uh, what, I, what I'm really interested in and not poems that are, you know, about something like, for example, gun control, right? It's an, it's a necessary topic to discuss. For me, it's just not a poetic place that I would go. Um, so I, I think I prefer, I prefer more of a kind of cloud of unknowing, if you know what that is, um, um, you know, this idea that you can't know, the only way to know a God, or in this case, to know anything really, um, is to not know. Um, and so I think that's sort of the engine of my poems, the sort of not knowing, and the, and the sort of the pleasure of trying to know. But knowing um, that you'll never know. So this is interesting, because when we think of a writer, I think many think of someone who is trying to communicate, who has something to communicate and is trying to communicate that thing. But you seem to be saying that you're having more of an experience and you're trying to help someone have an experience rather than trying to transfer knowledge or information. Exactly. I know very little, right? You know, I know some facts. Sometimes my facts are wrong. You know, <laughs> there's very little that I know. But I, I think that I, 30 years of thinking more, I started writing poems when I was six, you know, thinking about what a poem is, why a poem, um, you know, what I remember as a child, or not a child, but a young woman thinking, you know, I'm from, I'm like a suburban girl from Connecticut, like, you know, what do I have really to offer, you know, Um and I think as, you know, one studies poetry um, and, it, you know, Iowa was a very formative time for me, even though I was sort of resisting what was happening in the in the mainstream of the of the program. Um, um, oops, I'm sorry, I just got a message. So now I'm confused. What was I saying? Um, what was I saying? You talked about <laughs> Iowa and how you weren't in the mainstream of the program or how you didn't perceive yourself as being that. Right. And so I'm not, you know, I'm, and, and not that those poems that were being written were about things either. I mean, I think one of the great lessons I learned at Iowa, the first, really the first lesson I learned was that poems are not about anything. They're really from a place. And I really took that to heart. Um, and I would say also, since we're 
you know, talking, uh, we're discussing this in front of uh, Russian poets, you know, that Akhmatova was actually very important to me um, in terms of sort of showing, you know, a guide where to go um, if I wasn't going to be interested in this sort of postmodern work. Like I wanted, I wanted to be a real poet, you know, with a large voice and a large soul. Um, and so that's what I tried to do. That's what I tried to do. Um, I, I think some, something you know, that we, that Reagan, we were talking about earlier today is something really terrible happened in America yesterday. And this is something, these shootings have become something uh, all too common. And this is something that I know that you feel very strongly about. So I'm wondering, we've talked, we were just talking about how poems aren't really for communicating messages. But do you think that we sort of have, there's a place for us in talking about those things or addressing situations that are political or cultural? Absolutely, absolutely. I'm not the poet to do it though, right? I'm not skilled in, in that in that regard, um, you know? I, and it's, it's very interesting because Jeffrey and I were actually at Iowa when there was a mass murder on campus 30 years ago, um, Gang Lu. And, you know, I, I think five people died. I can't remember. It was, you know, but that's actually something I block out when one of these things happen. But we had some really effective poems come out of the workshop about that. I mean, Brian Young, I'm thinking of, um, mm -hmm. you know, he, re, you know, he, Gang Lu, he reloads in the snow. I mean, that's a very beautiful and, and timeless image of, of, you know, of that event. And um, I think I'm just not the one to, to, do those poems. I'm, it's not what I'm really interested in. It would be really forced and frozen. It would be terrible. They would be terrible poems. So you just used the word beautiful to describe Brian Young's poem that was about a terrible thing. I'm wondering what, I find your poems very beautiful, um, always very beautiful, even though they're often about things that are not thought of as beautiful, even though they're often about subjects that are very ugly. Um, so can you talk just a little bit about beauty and your conception of beauty and its place in poetry? How dare you? Oh my God. Kind of a question. <laughs> <laughs> it's a huge question. Well, it's something to really struggle with too, right? Um, I mean, I, I've tried to make poetry sort of as complicated <laughs> as possible. Um, beauty, right? I think when we were at Iowa, you know, it was everybody was sort of like beauty, you know, you know, beauty is, is a false reality. Um, and I, I, I don't know if I agree with that. I mean, you know, beauty is, um, I mean, why we get up in the morning, probably. Um, the, today was pretty hard to get up. Um, beauty, well, you have to also wonder what, what kind of beauty are we talking about, right? It's like, there are lots of really, uh, giant poems being written that have some beautiful imagery in them, right? Um, for my taste, these poems might, uh, might be a little loose uh, with lots of images that are beautiful. I'm not sure the sum of it ends up to be something that's totally beautiful. Um, it's a very hard question. I mean, I think we count, like, you know, as a child, six years old, you go, like, you try to write about a peony, right? You're like, poetry is about flowers or beauty, right? And then, but then, you know, if you're really going to be a poet, you have to go beyond the beauty of the peony. And you really have to go inside the peony and find where the spiders live and the ants, you know? And then you got to watch the peony die. And then you got to describe that. So, I'm just much more interested sort of in the other side of beauty, which I find totally beautiful, like the ruin and decay, um, you know, which is absolutely our reality. Um, we are not, we are not built to last, you know? Um, and so, you know, it's like, get your beauty while you can, um, but also in, make sure that you're, that the beauty is, is like meaningful and hard won, right? Not a gloss of beauty. So you just mentioned that, that that was a beautiful thing you just said, Reagan. Thank you. Um, something that you mentioned in, in there was the word ruin. Um, mm -hmm. And I know that this is something that you love to talk and think about and write about. 
are the ruins of ancient Paleolithic and Neolithic civilizations. You talk about civilizations that are 10,000 years uh, before a common era. Would you talk a little bit about that and, and the place of that in your thinking and in your work? Sure. I mean, I've only sort of started to write about it, this interest in the last couple of years, mainly because I've interacted with um, a lot of Neolithic sites in um, Scotland and Orkney. Um, it's funny, though, because I'm thinking so much about the mammoth huts, because um, I teach these architecture students um, at Pratt, and um, nobody really teaches them ancient architecture. Um, it's kind of strange to me. Um, and so I'm always shoving these things in their faces and they're, they're kind of rolling their eyes like, why do I need to know about Gobekli Tepe? And I'm like, oh my God, you need to know about Gobekli Tepe. Um, you know, it's about deep time. Um, there's nothing more fascinating than the material culture left behind to me. Um, and the idea of digging down through dirt that got, you know, we don't know how, sometimes these places were buried, sometimes just naturally they were erased from the landscape. I think of like the last person to walk away from one of these ruined sites. Um, there's a kind of terror involved in a sublimity of thinking about these sites. Um, I think about Gobekli Tepe in Turkey, you know, there's this hill that was there for thousands of years. And the reality, if you did like a cross section of the hill, would be that all of those chapels were just standing there under dirt, you know, just standing there. Um, it's sort of like a shipwreck underwater. Those images really frightened me um, in a good in a good way. Um, but I think, too, you know, sifting down through looking for artifacts, um, you know, if I ever find a an art, uh, I'll have to go to you know England to do it, but or Scotland. If I ever find a flint, I will be the happiest girl around. <laughs> I, I have to say it's interesting you talk about this because I've taken many walks with you around New York City, where you live. That there are many big buildings in New York and many new structures here. Um, and one of the things that I notice you're always doing, and this part of the reason I love taking walks with you is there's a lot of stopping, going, there's a lot of pausing, because you're always looking at things on the ground like old manhole covers, and you're always finding things like weeds and things growing in the urban landscape that seem like so unlikely things to find and are in such profusion. I think that's the, you know, that's the great beauty of, of life and looking, right? Um, I love the old poking through to to now, right? So the 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 man who laid down the um, you know uh, manhole cover on my street, he is dead, okay? But the manhole cover is still there, um, and also these things are quite beautiful. It you know they also inter they connect with industry and and lots of other interesting ideas. But obviously, I mean, poets love palimpsests, right? There's there's um, that's the, that's the word I am privileged to teach my students at Pratt. They've never heard the word before. And once they learn it, it's, you know, they see them everywhere. They see palimpsests everywhere and it can't help but make your life a deeper experience. I mean, we're not, you know, we're not here to be glossing over existence because, you know, I wake up every morning and I think of death almost immediately. Like, what's it going to, you know, <laughs> what is going on here? Um, and I love consciousness, even though it can be really painful. And I, you know, I love the more, I love mornings you wake up and you think, oh my God, but then, you know, consciousness really comes on like a light bulb and, you know, it's a privilege, it's a privilege. So we should look at our environments incredibly closely. And if we can start looking at weeds, you know, we can start loving plants better maybe um, and realize that without them, we're dead. Not proselytizing, sorry. <laughs> Ray, and I, I could listen to you talk about these things all day. And what's really interesting is I feel like you learn so much about your work and your, your poems by listening to you speak because you've talked about how poems aren't really for communicating 
I mean, you're not interested in subjects, let, let's say, writing about specific subjects. And I'm hearing all of these interesting things that inform your work, maybe subconsciously. Um, interesting to talk about subconsciousness. So many of the things that you're talking about are things that are underneath. Even yeah. flowers are coming from underneath. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Roots. Um, so a lot of, there's a lot of interesting things. Go ahead. What were we going to say? No, no, no. I mean, just, you know, I love to think of the underside of the weed too, right? You know, you see the weed, but then what's going on underneath the weed is sometimes very dramatic, you know, very complicated and very beautiful. Maybe this is a good time to listen to some of the things that are welling up from the inner life of Reagan Good. And I would love to hear some of your poems. Are you ready to read some for us? Just some, yes. Okay. <laughs> I um, and and what, what we can do is we'll hear some of your poems and then we'll open it up for some conversation and some um, sessions. Um, and so let's hear some of Reagan Good. Um, before we hear Reagan Good, I think we should hear some Ekmatova um, because, again, she I'm not just pulling her out because of where I am today, but um, where am I today, actually? Um, but uh, she was so important to me. She really was to kind of cut through the bullshit, excuse me, of what I saw happening sort of in the post postmodern um, very self-conscious post-postmodern work that was coming out when we were young. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, this is one of my favorites. <clears throat> Willow. I was raised in checkered silence in the cool nursery of the young century. Human voices did not touch me. It was the wind whose words I heard. I favored burdocks and nettles. But dearest to me was the silver willow, my long companion through the years, whose weeping branches fanned my insomnia with dreams. Oddly, I have survived it. Out there, a, a stump remains. Now other willows with alien voices in tone under our skies. And I am silent as though a brother had died. Um, beautiful. Um, that seems like such a perfect segue into your work. Um, Burdocks and um, nettles. Absolutely. <laughs> the Burdocks and nettles. Okay. Um, it is just general, Reagan Good reads her poems. I, th I don't know what's going on here, but I, I'm not, I think there's, the poem should be translated and there should be. Oh, do we have the translator ready? The translation? Not sure. Not sure. I'm just going to read. I'm just going to read a poem called Pomegranate. Um, what an ugly thing in the Lord's hands. Our world packed with bloody potentialities. And sack the seeds, the seeds, the varied driveways and droveways and springtime doors. The red ball loiters in the cosmic alleyway. You, a leather apple choked with seeds. Gelled blood drops in your fish skin hood. A baby's brain of tightly packed neuron beads. A bloody ambitious brain thinking miraculous things. Hark, the nightingale doth singeth in your hands. Gleal piths a skeleton of wan and papery ribs. This dry peritoneum is not a greasy bone. It is the Christ himself the baby holds. Um, I'll read a poem called Black Screen, uh, Rain, No Thunder. Um, these are you know, things on YouTube, you can sadly play as a 21st century person um, to fall asleep. Um, and in the poem, I'm just thinking that um, all of the ways that in which I receive nature, but it's over um, electronics. Again, that sounds like the poem is about that. I hope it isn't, but that's part of what's happening. Um, black screen rain, no thunder. I am not a robot yet I listen to electronic rain. At night, 
by the window under the ceiling fan as it winds down electric wind, natural noise packaged to play, old rain, heavy drops sunk in sound from behind mountains on a dark morning, far back when rain sound entered a microphone on a windowsill, raindrops captured as they fell, felted piano keys drumming now, 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 Quality rain sounds for 10 continuous hours, unlike the hard stops and starts of real rain. Who can sleep in this world? The sea beams glitter, pitter pat, pitter pat. Radio rain falls from the dark past the central gate, Tannhauser Gate, it is called, off the shoulder of Orion, a gate for all the water of the world to rain through. It falls in dot dash lines, not to evaporate, but to join itself later, later to recirculate. I slept with two candles in glass tubes, lit all night, crackling like oceans, those glassy fire holes. In midwinter, a long black day becomes short. Sleepless this winter and spring, my mind a robots, awake on dark channels and greasy ribbons, switching from platform to platform in telephonic states of fear. The tubes burned through daylight into evening, hot tubes, hot as sun, as tabletop suns, white phosphorus beams, two barrels of a weak ray gun shooting into night steady as a dying cat's stare. I lay still, my meat rife with synthetic chemicals and ugly thoughts. Da data, time to die, said Roy Batty in the rain. Pitter pat go the plastic beads on pristine ranges. The mind is the burl in the wood, the hard knot, the dark meat, listening to 10 continuous hours of natural rain sounds. I woke to real rain at the window, on car roofs, garbage cans, woke to songbirds on the device, singing years ago in France. Historical birds singing, no peace, no peace, no peace. Um, this is another sort of electronic poem. Um, this is called Digital Horses Are the Talk of the Crypto World. That was a headline I saw one day. Um, and I had had a horse when I was at graduate school. It sounds very fancy. It really wasn't. Um, uh, but this sort of references that horse. And there was a stud horse named Kronos at this barn um, that was sort of a cash cow. <laughs> Poor horse. Digital horses are the talk of the crypto world. Real ones are real. They are blood furnaces with globe eyes, their backs sweat in a saddle shape. But you can scrape the sweat off with a tool, then run a cold water hose over one until it quivers and shifts. The fake ones are thin and electric, eat coins. They run in static, hooves sharpened to points, wire maned, rubber reined, ridden by mannequins. My real horse ran to me from the hot field in summer. The horse ran towards me and through me, past the pigeons in the ring rafters, into the aisle, through the spider webs and moats past the hayloft, past the outdoor ring and the mounting block where a mare walked before the stallion emerged from the barn. In an empty stall, I'd cried and sunk to my knees. Kronos giving his seed, someone said, into a rubber vial, seed cast like a dandelion's then, so they said, sent through the mail, a progenitor of equine babies everywhere. Now where Kronos and the mare and my horse, where? The hoary dandelions curl and sway their bald centers like spider eggs or better, like the spider's central body without its eight legs. Um, 
Oh, I'll read. I think I'll just read two more if that's okay. Poor, poor Dimi or three more. Poor Dimitri did so much work um, translating these poems. Um, to sort of re reference some of the um, uh, prehistoric stuff that Jeffrey mentioned, I will just say, um, uh, this poem is this is a poem is about you know fossilized excrement. It's called a coprolite um, in architectural terms, um, but it, it's a bit about um, it's a bit about just you know being a poet and 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 keep going even if the world doesn't care, right? Um, because if it does, who's going to care if it's not if it's not me? <laughs> um, so it's a, it's a Anyway, it references also a, a braid. Oh, Jeffrey, stop dinging me. Um, it references a braid um, that was found in a grave, uh, Anglo-Saxon grave. Braid like a coprolite. At last, the strands form a thick braid of hair to be left behind in tissue or in a book or box. Such long and strong hair it is today to be braided. After such failure, one should have no hair. But I combed internal strands and inside rope. It, it ends like a Portuguese man of war's hot tentacles. It grew down my throat to my pelvis where it stopped by a hard and glossy knot, like a show horse's tail, brushed, then bound in braids. One tucks the ratty strays under the waxed ball, to see the work in its widowhood. Black boats in the reeds, they rock cradles of ruin. All thoughts and memories wove the hanging braid. Anxiety of influence, confluence, and words fed the hair like eggs and oils, so it grew luxuriantly, internally. I thought an overseer accounted for each strand until recently. Just now, I felt the braid sway inside me, a heavy chain or a waxed ship rope knotted at its end, then burned. My braid reminds me of the Saxon braid on a trowel dug up from a grave. It resembled common excrement, but for the twine at its tip, or an equine or bovine coprolite, or a cursed plate that, no matter how long buried, will simply not disintegrate. Um, I'll read a poem called Metaphys, Metamorphous um, Astrum, excuse me, Asterism, can't even pronounce my, my own words. Um, basically about the uh, stars. Um, and um, how the Cygnus, um, the, the swan constellation was actually very important to early man. Um, um, and that is all I'm saying. Uh, metamorphosis uh, asterism. Cygnus burns above the shallow vegetal plates. Bones the color of rain float up from the water hole. A large swan flies downward towards the fox, the harp. Winged progeny in the fox's paws, the smaller swan continually eaten in the fox's fixed and open mouth. What glue holds the stars fast? We know they fall. They are sealed with foul fats, moistened with leaf glue to make the bones buoyant and the hard water sink. Earth and sky make a map of our metamorphosis from child to orphan to nothing at all. Our bonfires are stars at our feet that pop and then disintegrate. Somewhere there is a chariot and elsewhere a giant ship with tall sails, though it never leaves the port. Cygnus burns above the shallow sucking plates flies at the slit of the starry way, saying, this way in, young swan, fly the borealis, fish trap, horse, crab, and the lyre, nearby, a fiery pop, and then the smell of fire. 
Um, I think I will just read one more. Um, this one is uh, called Sparrow's Song. Shall I be of the sparrow? Instead, I am of the blood eagle. The curve of a rose's thorn mimics these lungs drawn through to make two bright red wings for a small child, a hopping hellion hung high in the branches left to rot. If I am of the sparrow, then I shall be of the sparrow. The sparrow in the evergreen, not the eagle in the ash, or the rose in the lozenge, rather than the spiral in the trumpet, or the boar in the river, rather than the skins in the woods, never the crow for its honor, rather the cardinal for its hood. These abominable wings, useless, such heavy sacks of blood, I hate, I hate, I hate too much. How could I, fed on love, betray a heart of hate? Watch me bow, watch me scrape. I am this way, not the other way. The world has made me what I am, and I have assumed the eagle's shape. I have not always been of the eagle. As the sparrow, I was of the shallow and the fern, the moss and the spore the pebble and the worm. Should I not be of the sparrow? Low, unloved and wronged? No, if I am of the blood eagle, then I shall be of the blood eagle. Okay, I think that's, I think that's it. Um, I could read another, but I will just wait and hear what happens next. Hello. <laughs> Okay. Um, oh, looks like I'm back. Uh, Reagan, that was a fantastic reading. That was, um, I was really struck by that last poem. Um, absolutely beautiful. And so many things in that poem, so much happening there, not mm. only on, on the level of image, but the music too. And when I hear your poems read, I can really hear your concern uh, with rhythm and meter and music. I think, you know, not to a scientific degree, right? I'm not, I'm not like a, a scansion, um, you know, genius. In fact, I, you know, in, in, when I do scansion, I get it wrong. I cry, all kinds of things happen, but I believe in music and poetry. And I think that that is what we are really missing here in America. I think that um, innovation has taken over the idea of, of music or something has gone on. Um, something's gone on where the hardest part of poetry or the, the heart of poetry has been sort of skipped. You know, it's, it's sort of, that's too hard. And that might take a long time. And in America, you know, we have a kind of poetry industrial complex. We have a huge machinery behind everything here. And, you know, I think poems get written very quickly and, you know, music takes time to, to develop and, and to develop in your technique. And, you know, hopefully then you become like the dancer and it's just there, um, right? You can't separate that the dancer from that dance. And that's what I hope I've done uh, or, or I do. Um, it, it, it definitely goes to what Stephanie Burt said. Um, he attends your sense of pentameter and music going along with a sense of experiment that you rarely see these days. I think it's quite fantastic. You can feel the tradition um, in your poems. I think we're gonna have some questions now, um, Reagan. Okay. So sure. if I can get any questions through the chat, um, maybe we can um, have some questions addressed to you. Let's see if we can get that. And if we can't, then I will just continue the conversation with you for a few minutes. Um, I picked I some. Oh, I picked some, um, can you see it? Oh, right. There's some um, shepherd's purse this morning. Do you know shepherd's purse? I don't. I can see it up there on top of, well, why don't you, you should probably tell us something about that picture behind you also. Oh, yes. That, <laughs> yes, that, um, that watercolor was owned by the great poet Wallace Stevens, um, who is, you know, sort of having a, a down moment 
in the culture. I, you know, you know, there are many things wrong with him. There are many things wrong with lots of poets, but I still read them. Um, but anyway, I did this crazy thing. I think I thought I was rich for five minutes. Um, oh my God, Andrew is watching this. Andrew, <laughs> my my boyfriend is watching this and now he knows. Um, and these are, this is shepherd's purse. They're so beautiful. Um, if you can see the, they're shaped like a little shepherd's purse. And these just are growing. This, I think um, this might go directly to this question that we just got, Reagan, which is where do you get your inspiration from? First question. Oh, you know, the material world, I guess I'd say. Um, Yeah, I think I think you know the material, the material, the material world. I really love. I do. I mean, and, and I don't mean Chanel handbags. You know, I um, I'd rather. You know, I I used to think they were really interesting and sort of you know really happening, but that just lasted for a little while. Um, you know, I'm much more interested in this than I am, you know, shopping at Fendi or something. Um, it sounds to me from what you've said that you also get inspiration from other poets. Um, and I also oh, yeah. want to go Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, I, that, that's just sort of a given, right? It's like we become poets because we read poems and then think, I want to be inside that. I want to know how to build a world like that, you know? Um, so definitely. And, you know, the thing is, I love the tradition, except for what it left out, right? It's like, I, I do... I was raised on it and I, and I, it was my first love really. Um, hold on. I think my cat wants to get in. Um, that poppy. Yes, he did. Um, so, you know, I was raised on, on Bishop. My mother was a poet. And so I was sort of raised on Bishop and Lowell and Berryman um, and Plath and Sexton um, mainly uh, and then, you know, went on to read Shakespeare and, and Milton and Chaucer, again, all these, you know, the tradition white men. Um, but, you know, Emily Dickinson, uh, Wallace Stevens, you know, John Ashbery. Um, I'm very in love right now with an English poet named Alice Oswald. I think she's really um, one of the best poets writing right now. I'm sorry. Um, we're having... I have another question for you, Reagan. Okay. Uh, is, um, uh oh, that just disappeared. Okay. And I didn't have a chance to see it. Did you see that question? No. Uh oh. Can we bring that back up? Oh, how do they um, portray my emotional state? Uh huh. Oh, Matilda. Um, I mean, I, I think the uh, yes. Well, I wanted to build on that question um, about your emotional state. Several of the poets that you just mentioned that you draw inspiration from are considered confessional poets, right? Oh. Poets like yes. Lil and poets like Plath, right? Um, and Sexton. And I'm wondering that if that bears on that question at all about, about you know, the part that your feelings play. Those poets were confessional poets and talked about feelings explicitly. Go ahead. Right. And I think I've actually had to sort of um, strip some of the, that learning down for me. Like, you know, I loved the confessionals, but I really at a very early age, I realized I didn't necessarily want to write about myself, you know, my the 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 details of my bio, not 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 really, you know, um, I didn't want to write about fights with my father or, you know, what, whatever, you know, or my depression, which I would just say, hopefully is just seamlessly in the poems, you know? Um, and I think also that when the poems are good, it's because feeling is involved. And sometimes I wonder about that feeling. Is it this, you know, is it a kind of blanded out feeling that I, I want to get to, um, you know, I think I do. It, it, you know, it's like people talk about, you know, Wallace Stevens, for example, um, being Poppy, being this, you know, 
very um, sort of abstract, that's not the right word, but sort of high level, difficult poet, right? But he was the guy walking in the street with, with sticky buns in his pockets, right? He was a big guy. He was a big man, physical man in the world. And in order to, to continue his life, right? He, he needed to be, go to that other thing. Um, and while I have gained some weight during COVID, I'm not, you know, a, you know, a, a, a big physical presence in the world, but maybe the, my love of, of materialism um, makes me want to, you know, write a kind of poem that's almost divorced from my, divorced from my feelings. And this would get to the idea of that. You're not, you know, it's like what T.S. Eliot says, right? Only somebody who has a personality would know <laughs> what it is to not want to write through that personality. Um, so I sort of think of like, can I get to a mystical state? Um, you know, can I get to a mystical state? You just got a very nice comment here that used oh, some very right. nice adjectives to describe your poems, deep and otherworldly. Um, and Eliot could be heard in their echoes of T.S. Eliot. Oh, I love Eliot. You know, a big drag, big weirdo. Um, you know, anti-Semitic, you know, biggie, biggie problems. I don't know, you know, I don't know. Th those poems are incredible. I can't not read them. And I've been, I, I remember I memorized the love song of J. Albert Proofrock when I was 13, you know. I was probably only 13 year old in Westport who had it memorized. Um, but I knew it was a secret world, you know, it was another world. I, I, Reagan, I was excited by that poem too when I first re uh, read it. I remember as a teenager feeling very excited by, by that poem while also not having any idea really what it was about. Zippity doo da, right? <laughs> right. But, you know, but the all oh, the questions that poems, at, you know, literally are you're being asked, and that just, the, you know, what can you say? What can you say? Poets are as messed up as anybody else. Um, well, also speaks to the idea that music is a powerful thing. Just music and images are very powerful. Oh, aren't they? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, the wasteland is like a dustbin of, of of amazing images, right? We'll never, it'll, we'll never fathom the depths probably of that of that beautiful poem with all of its historical, you know, references and you know, myth and it's a, you know, he's a very rich model. Um, okay. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I see there is so much erudition in your poems, Reagan, and you remind me of Eliot also in that respect. There are many, I mean, I, I heard such an array of different references also. I heard reference to Blade Runner, uh, American science fiction movie, and other poets, and all kinds of amazing things in there. But think um, about that scene with Roy Batty, that amazing monologue. Oh my God, that's like, and that's, you know, a spontaneous utterance, right? It's like the great poetry, some kind of spontaneous, you know, utterance um, in another character. Oh, I, I find that just the most, one of the more beautiful things. You, you, it seems like then you have, you can draw from everything. You're well, drawing think, from film. Go ahead. I, I think that's the goal, right? So that was my goal anyway. Just can I, can I make a voice that's big enough to encompass a lot of things, you know, that, that I care about, that I love, that I'm interested, that I don't understand. Um, it's scary to kind of break your baby technique when you're young, right? You kind of, you have to kind of drop it. And then you write all these crazy poems that don't really work, but, you know, hopefully now they're, now they're working. Hopefully, hopefully they're, they're working. Well, I would say we heard a lot of amazing things working today in listening to your poems. And I think this is a good place to end on that fantastic note, Reagan. Um, and thank you everybody for listening and um, thank you for the Meet a Poet series in general. It's so hard because I'm actually not meeting anybody. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even see you. Well, thank you so much, Reagan. Oh, oh, wait, here's one more thing. What advice, this is a good one, can you give someone starting out? Um, don't be abstract initially. Just write physical description, right? 
is just keep doing that. Keep writing your images, honing, honing the image. The image is your words, really. Um, and uh, pay attention to what excites you, right? And what kind of confuses you, right? Because then you're sort of in the cloud of unknowing and then you can fight for the lines, right? And so hopefully each line has some life in it. And just keep writing, just keep writing. Because when we're writing poems, we're not doing other bad things. A, a, a question, one more thing, a question that some young writers might have for you is, is publishing poems in journals and how you would go about doing that. Oh. And what that means. Figure it out yourself. <laughs> I'm kidding. I mean, what does it mean? I don't know. <laughs> I, you know, I try not to think about this stuff too much. Um, it's lovely to get published, but it doesn't really mean anything. But I know that the ch those kind of chits are important early on. Um, but I have no advice at all, actually. <laughs> okay, any other questions? Okay, Reagan, thank you very much um, for that amazing reading and for sharing all of those uh, ideas about poetry with us. Um, and thank you, thank you to the audience, thank you for the questions, okay. All right. So now we just, we unceremoniously disconnect. <laughs> Is that what happens in the 21st century? I, I think so. Oh my God. Okay.